40 years down the line, what happened to these characters? And Dee has become a nun because they. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Danny is a vet technician. I just think that would be incredible. <laughs> Welcome, friends and fans, to another edition of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And today, we are going back to chasing rabbits, only to find angry bats and rabid St. Bernards with some incredibly talented cast members from the 1983 film adaption of Stephen King's novel, Cujo. So without further ado, let's hop in our forward pinto and see what we find. Our first guest is a director whose body of work includes Alligator, Cat's Eye, and the highly undervalued crime film, The Lady in Red. Today joins us as the director of Cujo. Please welcome Mr. Lewis T. Hi, Patty. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thanks for being here, sir. This is, this is a really great privilege. I, again, I, I am a great fan of yours. You have worked on some really, really great films. Again, The Lady in Red, uh, I think... It was at that tail end of that really that 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 crazy era of uh, that Corman uh, was doing with those it was those last those crime drive-in films and I thought it knocked it out of the park and again I love that cast any movie with Robert Conrad you know uh, Christopher Lloyd and Kitten the Tibby Dodd is automatically awesome to me so well it was my first feature and I was very lucky it was sort of the tail end of Rogers uh, uh, Grindhouse films and. Uh, uh, I was just really lucky. We put together an incredible team. Jamie Horner did the score, yeah. uh, one of his first features. Yeah. And uh, Daniel Lacombe, a great French cinematographer. But the, maybe the best thing, uh, were well, two of the best things. One was the uh, script by John Sayles. Yes. Uh, and uh, a cameo by Robert Forster. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he had, well, I'll talk later about him, maybe because how he came about to be in the film and later in Alligator is uh, an interesting story and really contributed to my success. Oh, well, abs no, absolutely. And again, uh, a great body of work. I could, yeah, trust me, I could spend an hour just with you alone. I would love to hear about uh, the second unit work on Death Race 2000, another film that I absolutely adore from that era. But we're here to talk about Cujo today. So let's bring out this uh, some of these casts that you ha had something to do with. Our next guest, he is an actor whose credits include Who's the Boss and Time Stalkers, and recently been seen in The Quarantine Bunch. Today he joins us to discuss the role of the young Tad Trenton. Please welcome Denny Pintaro. Hello. Hey. I keep forgetting I have to look up here. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Danny, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? It's this is really this is such a cool medium. It really makes um brings everyone together in a time when it's hard to get together and it's scary to get together. And it also I've got I already know that I have uh, someone from France who's been looking forward to chatting with me today. So it's like the only opportunity for the people in other countries really to interact with us. I know D travels the world doing the conventions, but hasn't been in a while, I can imagine. So um, anyway, yeah. hi. Hey, you know, no, absolutely. Uh, we here at the GalaxyCon virtual stage, uh, we, we created this out of necessity. And yeah, we have found it is not a replacement for physical shows, anything. It's an outlet for people who don't have access to them. And you're right. It enables us to bring together guests like yourselves in these in these uh, this, this format that might be a little difficult to do in the, in the meantime. So yeah, absolutely, boss. Welcome to our little corner of cyberspace. So glad to have you here and salute to all of our friends and fans. Hello. <laughs> and next, she is an actress whose many credits include The Howling, The Hills Have Eyes, and of course, E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Today, she joins us to discuss the role of stalwart hero, Donna Trenton. Please welcome back the always lovely Dee Wallace. Hi, everybody. Hey, Dee, how are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm so happy to be here with Lewis and Danny. I... They're, they have been family to me ever since we gruelingly got through that shoot of Cujo. And I love them so much. And I'm glad to be here with them and with everybody. Oh, absolutely. So glad to have you back. And indeed, everyone, welcome to the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Our team is going through our chat room right now to pull out the questions for you. In the meantime, I just love to see how how did this project uh, begin? And Lewis, I think as director, we should start with you. 
Uh, well, how it began for me is uh, I received a call from the producer, Dan Black, uh, telling me that Stephen King had recommended me to direct the film because Stephen King had seen Alligator and written about it in a, one of his nonfiction books. And Dan, so I Dan Macabre. Dan Macabre, right. Mm -hmm. So I rushed out to the bookstore, bought this book, which I happen to have up here in Aspen with me, uh, read it, called Dan Black immediately, and uh, said I'd love to do it. And uh, so I, I was the first and third director on the movie. <laughs> Yep. yep. <laughs> Even I know that. Okay. Uh, I got to jump right to something that's really important. Sure. Um, another director was hired because there were some complications between somebody at the studio and me, which I never really fully understood, but they wound up hiring another director. Uh, that did not work out, and Dan called me back. Uh, and told me I was his first choice, and I came back on. But I really want to give credit to the second director because when I came back on, Danny and Dee Wallace were already cast, and I had a great team on the picture, but the two most important members of that team were Danny and Dee, wow. and that other director was the one that cast them with Dan, wow. with Dan. So I, I really have to give a shout out to him for that. And Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. And, Thank you. And uh, that's showbiz. That's <laughs> that's that's the that's how crazy things things could be. But uh, absolutely glad that uh, you were able to come back to the project. So good on good on you and good Me on your too. producer. For, good on you, producer your producer for for fighting for you. Well, yeah. awesome. So, so, uh, so, D, Danny, uh, which of you think uh, came on board uh, first? I, I don't know. I think I did because yeah. I had done the howling for um, for Dan, and um, and so when Cujo came along, I mean, I don't know what what went down with the second director, um, but. Dan called me and and said, "Would you be interested in doing Cujo?" Because I, I'd done the howling for him, and in the interim, ET had come out, so you know my name had gone up in worth, and um, and that's how. First of all, I Dan Blad has a very big place in my heart, and I loved working for him, and um, would wanted to work with him again. Uh, I just felt really safe with Dan and, and heard and taken care of. And um, so when he sent me the script, we talked about a few things like the nudity. <laughs> and, um, and then everything uh, was on. Uh, and I, I just have to tell this story, Lewis, really quick. So the second director, the first day um, we were we were talking on the first day of shooting, and he looked at the wardrobe and he said, "No, no, no, this is all wrong. No, uh, you have to not have a bra and have a see-through blouse." And and I went, "Excuse me," and he said, "Yeah, yeah, this is all. This whole story is." is a sexual connotation, you know, connotations. And I went to Dan and I went, I think I'm doing a different film because this is not the way I see the film. I see the film as a mother doing anything to save her son. Yeah. And, and I told him what went down and he went, what? And I said, did nobody have a meeting about any of this? So I was, I was extremely happy when Lewis came on board and we were all on the same team. And yeah, I just think that's an interesting story that a lot of the fans probably don't know. <laughs> it's a, that's a really interesting story to me uh, because 
the director had a point of view on the story uh, and how he wanted to approach it. I had a different point of view. Uh, what interested me with the story was the fear that this was a family that was being torn apart by fear. The husband uh, was fear of financial insecurity. His wife was afraid of being bored and growing old uh, in this remote town in Maine. And uh, all that fear was filtering down to the son, uh, who was uh, then, it, he was absorbing that fear and seeing monsters in the closet and that kind of, and that really fascinated me because a lot of my life has been spent trying to overcome fear, you know, to, to, to learn what, what are the things I'm afraid of and, and grow, grow beyond it. And I'm here to report, I think I've done a pretty good job of outgrowing many of my fears, you know, at least okay. imaginary fears. And that's what this story is about, about imaginary fears. And I just want to give a shout out to all the fans out there, because I haven't done as many conventions as Dee and Danny, but the couple that I have done in person, uh, I have met so many of the fans from yeah. all walks of life who really appreciate and understand the material. Absolutely. And, and, and I'll never forget, you know, for those fans that are out there today listening, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing some of their comments and feedback later. I remember one guy when we were at the uh, reunion in Gettysburg uh, coming <laughs> out, you know, and I told him, I told him that I'd been approached to do a remake uh, and at one point, which never happened. I really wasn't interested uh, because I... I I ascribe to the John Huston theory that you shouldn't remake the good films. You should remake the near misses. And I, I don't know how you could do this one any better. But uh, he, this fan said, uh, if you do a remake, do it more from the dog's point of view. And I just saw that was such an interesting comment because in retrospect, you wouldn't have to lose anything about the fear and the family and dynamics. And but the dog, to me, the, the whole story revolves around the dog's disease. It's yeah. rabies, you know. And that would be such an interesting metaphor <clears throat> for a future remake. Anyway, hmm. that's, this is really just to, uh, for me to uh, express my appreciation for the fans out there. Absolutely. That, yeah. Absolutely. So, Danny, so, how, I don't know the story about how you got hired. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, you know, it, it's kind of handed down to me from my mom because I was only six at the time. But the story goes that um, I had been at the age of six. I had already been on As the World Turns for <laughs> three years by that point, acting my butt off on daytime television. And I guess maybe Dan Blatt or the producer, somebody saw me in As the World Turns and asked me to audition. And I just came in like any other audition. I, I didn't have any sort of special treatment. Um and the story goes that after the audition, um, I, my mom and I were going up the stairs in a stairwell and Dan Blatt was going down the stairs. We didn't really realize who he was. And my mother and I always had this saying after every audition that I did, and we were passing by and she said, okay, what do we always say? And I say, well, if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. And he, that just really stuck out to him and, um, and my mom says that he says that that's the whole reason I got the role. So, and well, never mind, I probably you, did a good job in the audition. <laughs> I thanked God every day I got up that I got you for my kid mm -hmm. in that movie. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I say it a lot. Oh, but it never gets old. I and love it. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it really was like working with another adult. Wow. You were so there and so alive and just so fearless. And smart. You know? Huh? And smart. And smart. So smart. Uh, and, you know, the, the scene where he has the seizure. Yeah. And I, of course, this is why I play so many mothers. So I'm mothering him and saying, okay, well, are you okay doing this scene? Is it scary for you? And Danny looks at me and says, oh, no, that happened to me when I was little. You want to see? <laughs> and he goes right into it, right? 
<laughs> and I thought, I am so not going to have to worry about this kid. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't, I'm, everybody asks me this all the time and, and I really don't have an answer other than to say that I really think I was born with like some magic sparkle or something because you can't teach a two, three, four, five, six year old to do yeah. the kind of thing that I was doing. And so whenever I hear these stories and think, my God, what other six year old is actually like, <laughs> no, I'm good. Are they going to move the camera there? Or are we going to do it from there again? Like, um, yeah. mm -hmm. there, it's just, it, it really did have to be something that I was born to do. I can, I have no other explanation really. Yeah. That's... Well, I sure am glad you were born to do it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, of course, having a, having all the, the effects challenges and everything else to it, um, what was, would you think maybe was the craziest day that each of you can recall from the set? <laughs> Every one of them. <laughs> I don't know, Lewis. What do you think? Well, shooting out uh, at the farm in the rain. Yeah. Uh, an occasional, occasionally the sun would break through and we'd get a shot. And uh, yeah, it was it was very difficult. But again, as I said before, I have a great. I had a great team, not just the actors, but the crew and the producer. Yeah. Everybody did a great job. And Jan. Uh, and Jan, the cinematographer, he was great. Uh, and I could go on and on talking about what it was like to work with him. I just want to tell one act anecdote about standing uh, in the rain out at that farm uh, with under an umbrella oh, that was on a C-stand. And the <clears throat> production manager, Neil Maclis, came walking up the hill whistling. <laughs> I said, Neil, what the fuck are you whistling for? Don't you realize it's raining? And we were losing time or we behind schedule. And uh, he said, he turned to me and he said, Louie, it's only a movie. And then <laughs> continued on. And I was so blown away by that, that his... Yeah, uh, perspective, you know, and it, it, it was only a movie, uh, but it was a movie that I loved doing. And there, there were so many hard days, difficult days yeah. and challenges. But yeah. with the help of everyone, Dee mentioned Jan de Bont, the cinematographer. Uh, he and I worked together a couple of times. He was just such a creative person. Everybody was great to work with. What do you guys, what do you think, Danny? Well, I, uh, I don't, I don't think a lot of people know this, but we, we filmed it in winter in um, yeah. Northern California. It's supposed mm -hmm. to take place deep in the hottest part of the summer. So challenge number one is trying to be there in um, shorts and no shirt and not mm -hmm. freeze my butt off. But I think, um, I think D and I would probably agree that one of the hardest days was definitely the gun, the gun scene. And the glass breaking and all of that. I, oh I always, my gosh! Yeah. That for me so, has always been one of the most amazing yeah. stories, for sure. Yeah. Mm. So you know, they told me that the glass had been treated, and now this is how I remember it, Lewis. Okay, <laughs> and that um, they were filming it in slow motion, so I had to really hit the glass, but it w wasn't going to break. Well, welcome to an actor's adrenaline. Three hits and the glass broke. Now we had rehearsed the whole scene so that we wouldn't get caught, you know, in a, in a bad decision. And I knew I the next thing I did was go in and get the kid out of the car. But now the glass is broken and part of my head is going, get the kid, get the kid. You've got to get the kid. And the other part's going, oh my God, there's glass. You can't drag him out like we were going to drag. Get the kid, get the kid. <laughs> right. Wow. So I, I don't hear, I think everybody was so stunned that, or I didn't hear cut. And so I went in and I, 
pick him up in my arms and do I do this stupid waddle to get him out of the car so Danny won't get hurt, but Ted will get out of the car and run all the way up to the the house and that's the first time I heard cut. Is that how you remember it, Lewis? Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Okay. I have to go back and look at the film again. You know, we're talking about a movie uh, we made uh, 40 years ago. And uh, though even I've seen it quite a few times, uh, as I remember that scene where, in which the glass broke and where you hit the glass is in slow motion mm -hmm. and when it breaks. Yeah. And this was not shot digitally, this was shot on film, which means that we were planning for the glass to break so that we could capture that in slow motion. Oh, so, I don't remember it that way at all. I know. Mm -hmm. Memories. Oh. <laughs> Memories okay. of but I think that we were hoping, or we kept doing multiple takes until the glass broke so that we could get that slow motion shot. Oh my God, I do not remember it that way at all. I remember the, the first time we tried to do the scene on the third hit, the glass broke. And that's the story that I heard too, because if you watch it really closely in the slow motion, the second time she hits the window, a part of the gun breaks off and exposes the metal underneath. And that's what actually hits the glass on the third trot moment, which is why the glass broke. So even though I don't remember it at all, I, I from watching the movie, that's how I felt like it had been on. My my story is much more dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, the interesting the interesting thing about memory is it's like Wikipedia, and every time you go back and look at it, you tweak it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah very true. So I, I, it's Forty yeah. years later, but the evidence is in. The fact that we were shooting it with a high speed camera. Hmm. The, the other really, another really difficult day for me was the big attack scene hmm. in the car. Um, you, so you see me and the stunt man because, and Dan was, was going to let me do it with the real dog until the morning of. And I came to this head and he said, D, I've changed my mind. You know, if you get hurt, you're the money, the film goes down, we can't, we just can't take the, the chance. Cause I did a lot of my own stunts, mm -hmm. right? That I remember yeah. anyway. Yes, sure. And, sure. Sure looked like you did. And so that scene is me with a stuntman, Gary Morgan, God love him, and the stunt woman with the real dog. Now, these dogs were trained within an inch of their lives. I'm telling you, I never felt afraid working with it. I don't think you did either, Danny, right? No, they made me laugh because every time they got in the car, they just went after that little mouse that they were trained to go after. They could yeah. care less about us. They were all I would laugh so hard. After, yep, they were all trained to go after toys. We literally had to tie their tails down because you saw them wagging. I think we left it in a couple of shots, right, Lewis? Yes. There's a, there's a couple, yes. But yeah. I'm telling you, the editor in that big attack scene should have won an award. I you cannot i can't even see where the seams are are put together but the the dog was trained the the stunt woman had its toy around her neck and so she would lean forward and that was the dog's cue to come forward but as soon as she leaned back the dog pulled back am i correct in that lewis yes Okay. Give a so, shout out to Carl Miller while you're at it. Oh, yes. Carl Miller had these dogs trained. Carl even, let's put it this way. The dogs were taken better care of than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, 
Carl Miller even slept in the barn with his dogs. Wow. That's how well they were taken care of. The beautiful and so well trained. But in that last scene, the the stunt girl comes forward and the dog leaps forward and then she le comes back and the dog pulls back and we hear cut we got it and then she did something like yes or came forward with until nobody had a hand on the dog and the dog did what it was trained to do which is come toward her and it got a little tip of her nose and bit it off and she's all fine she's beautiful yeah. they picked it up they sewed it on she's fabulous but dan came up to me and said see that's why that's why you didn't do it right and it wasn't the dog's fault it wasn't really anybody's fault no. it's just <laughs> kind of that moment where everybody goes yeah and we let down you know after right. after that incredible focus that we had to keep on that scene but i'll tell you looping that etc and headache number 500 wow. for me <laughs> i every, can imagine and, uh, and, i mean every single thing had to be matched it was crazy yeah oh yeah I, that 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 was what a hell of a uh, set of sessions so julie louise well uh we are gonna go to our audience questions so i say let's go ahead and switch that over and this first one comes from romeo who wants to know was there any ever any funny moments on the set that you can recall well yes i wish i had the picture in front of me of Lewis and Gary in the dog suit and me doing a kick <laughs> on the set. Gary, Gary really was our, our comedy relief. I mean, I would be into the scene and getting all hysterical and everything. I'd look over and Gary go deep. And he'd lift his leg up and be pissing on. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. There we go. Oh, look, yes. he's got the picture. <laughs> Is that good? Can you see it well? Good on yes. you. Oh, yeah. yeah, we saw it great, Danny. Yeah. That's great. I was, I, was, <laughs> I, was I was typing a note to my producer. I was like, Paul, find that picture. But all right, so Daddy, Daddy got it. Great. <laughs> That's great, Danny. Thanks. Um, yeah. Technology. <laughs> In addition to a man in the dog suit, we also had a dog in a dog suit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Carl, Carl Mil Miller had a lot more confidence before the movie that he could train Labrador retrievers than St. Bernard's. So he had one of his favorite lab, a, a St. Bernard suit concocted for the Labrador retriever. Wow. And so I was compelled to use it in one shot because we'd spent all that money on it. So there is a shot where uh, the we we see the uh, we see Cujo in the fog. Uh, the, the son uh, of I forget the character's name right now uh, sees Cujo. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, sees Cujo in the fog. So we shot his point of view with the laboratory retriever in the Saint Bernard suit, and because it did not like being in the suit. It, it kind of moved around like it had had too many vodka martinis and looked weird. <laughs> <really well. laughs> it actually worked for the film. I was about to say, yeah. What a... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can absolutely see that. And I do remember that. Yeah, I do remember that shot. Yeah, it was, yeah, well, a little wobbly. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a, it was a lot of fun because uh, Dee mentioned Jan de Bont, the cinematographer, before. Jan and I had known each other socially for a long time, and I've been waiting for an opportunity to work with them. And we're both uh, cinema buffs. And every day when we'd ride to location, we would uh, plan shots. We just let our imaginations run wild. And I said at one point, it'd be great to do a 360 degree shot wow. inside the Pinto. One of my favorite the Pinto the whole shooting movie. three weeks. And we were trying to figure out more inventive ways of shooting it. So it wouldn't get boring. And I said, how about a 360 shot? And uh, we all said, mm -hmm, we all think about it. A couple of weeks later, they were all this. He went out and bought a new Pinto and he put a little city on top of the Pinto. 
where all crew could get up there with the camera with uh, and unfortunately that I have a picture of that but it's back in LA as a matter of fact I might have it on my phone here I may show it in a second yeah. it was curious that the whole crew was on this little platform on top of the pinto so it was almost like a reverse periscope he sort of drilled a, drilled a hole in and yeah. spun it around okay yeah yeah, wow. and it really works so well in the film because yeah. we're all, because of the heat, getting delusional and, you know, and Danny is losing perspective and I'm passing out and it was really, really worked. Oh, Paul, blow him up. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's outstanding. It was, yeah, that, right, yeah. That's a scene for someone just watching the movie of this me just crying and screaming and crying as D is like passing out and saying, don't get out of the car, don't get out of the car, was, you know, just so intense. And then they cut to Danny. like, oh yeah. That was wow. when I ran across the room, oh yeah. Oh. They had built that, this, this set this that shot, way. That shot was based, on, yeah, I don't know, we were driving to the set one day, talking about a Russian, film that came out in around 1961 uh, called The Cranes Are Flying. And I said, you know, we were talking about how to shoot that scene where Danny comes back uh, from the bathroom and gets in bed. Uh, I thought it'd be fun to do a Cranes Are Flying shot. So Jan built that, this uh, platform uh, that uh, got the camera up there. And then Danny, Danny came running across the room and dives into bed and the camera turns upside down and yeah. uh, it, in slow motions. So it looked like he was falling into space. Yeah. It's uh, a great shot. Great yeah. shot. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Let's go ahead. Oh, Danny, did we uh, get a story from you or do you recall? I mean, you were young at the time. Yeah. Oh, I don't, I, I don't think I have any good fun. I mean, half of my stories are all secondhand stories from D or my mom or my dad <laughs> to begin with. So. Let me ask you this one. You got, you got a, you got one about the years uh, since being, rec being recognized as, Hey, were you the kid in the dog movie? You know? Oh yeah. I mean, I get that a lot. And I, uh, whenever we do these conventions, it's usually uh, who's the boss fan or a Cujo fan. It's rarely both. Uh, which I think is so interesting that, you know, just in terms of uh, people's capability of watching stuff, the Who's the Boss fans don't tend to be horror fans. Um, <laughs> but the yeah, combination weird. is really cool. Yeah. But every time they walk up to the table, I can almost immediately just peg that they're going to be a Who's the Bosser. I always say, are you a Who's the Bosser or a cujo -er? And they they say whichever. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I get uh, – uh, the the funniest story I think is probably happened very very recently. In fact, um, I am a vet technician here in Austin, and I was uh, at work early August. Um, and we had a Great Dane who literally came up to about my waist. I'm five six. He was up to about here, um, experiencing severe pain from this uh, issue that um, Great Dane puppies can have. And we were trying to get him to do something he did not want us to do and uh, bit me twice uh, in the forearm. I still have, let's see if I can, you can see. Oh, it. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I had eight puncture wounds on both sides, um, four stitches, and I couldn't move my fingers for almost a week. Um, and, you know, since I posted the first thing, the very first thing everyone said on Facebook, <laughs> When I, here I am trying to get sympathy for my near-death experience because apparently one of the punctures was right next to a vein and it could have been real bad, oh. Um, was, oh my God, Cujo, it's come full circle. Too bad it wasn't the first <laughs> Oh man, I was so mad. <laughs> it was, yeah. Oh, too bad it wasn't a St. Bernard's. I mean, literally, guys. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Uh, sometimes fandom, yeah. Oh no, well, this is friends. Oh, friends. This okay. is my personal oh. Facebook page, and they still <laughs> came out with it. it. It is pretty interesting that you can get through an entire movie about a rabid dog and not get hurt, and you're in your vet tech place and you get almost taken out. Yeah. I mean, 
It's kind of poetic in a way, Danny. <laughs> it sure is. Every time I tell someone I'm a vet technician, the full circle always happens. Yeah, sure. Life. Yeah. Oh, I still maintain the most dangerous thing on that set must have been using all those Pintos. <laughs> 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 because my, my, my family had one when I was growing up and it wasn't until years <laughs> later that I heard there oh yeah those things blow up all the time it's like well, my family had one what gives <laughs> yeah if I never see another Pinto in my life it'll be too soon <laughs> <laughs> oh gracious uh, let's roll another one and this comes from Alyssa who wants to know oh what would be the, either the uh, dream role or uh, uh, brand us out dream project for each of you oh well, one would be to work with all these guys again. I, for sure, coming from my heart, I would love that. Mm. Uh, and I've, don't laugh, I have always wanted to play a nun. Oh. That is, <laughs> that is challenged by her beliefs and her faith. Why mm. are you laughing, Lewis? I just love the idea. <laughs> <laughs> What, uh, D, I feel like at the last convention you mentioned that somewhere and somebody started coming up with an idea for uh, a movie for us where I'm a priest and you're the nun. I forget the details, but yeah, yeah we, we, were, we were talking about it. Hashing out table. ideas. Yeah. Um, right, but as everybody who says in your court, Lewis, I would love to do a, a get together with these folks again, but it, it, can only be if it's a Cujo remake. It can only be with no CGI. I oh, won't no. actually sign on to it if there's any CGI used in the film whatsoever. Yeah, that you know, I just did Critters Attack for Sci-Fi, and when they brought it to me, I said, "My first question is, are you going to use the real critters or CGI?" And they said, "No, no, the, we're going to do the real thing." I said, "My fans would kill me." If mm -hmm. I redid anything with CGI mm -hmm. like that, so they have weapons, so <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I'd so love to work with these two again. Also, uh, I told you that uh, I've been approached to do a remake, which would be, uh, which would have to be the same story set in 2022 or whenever it would be. No, Lewis. But I, but you could do a Cujo sequel, which mm -hmm. uh, we're using the same actors, and I just think it would be fantastic if we were to do a, a, a Cujo sequel forty down the line, forty years down the line. What happened to these characters? And D has become a nun because they, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Danny is a vet technician. I just think that would be incredible. <laughs> we, we got the story. I was. I couldn't figure out how to do it. And now I know this is. Oh my God. God. Yeah, That's because great. I have to deal with all the fear. So I've, mm. I've gone into religion to deal with all the fear. Yeah. Found religion. You thought that the, the, the almost inf the infidelity just was this, the dog was God punishing me. So I must say, yeah. <laughs> so there, there's, yep. Yep. There's some fertility in this. Absolutely. Ely Elissa, great question. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we got time for one, one or two more. Let's see what we got. Our uh, next one from John. John wants to know what's the scariest movie you've ever seen. Oh, uh, I'm gonna jump Exorcist. right in. Excuse me, D, you go. No, no. Exorcist for me. Oh yeah. Uh, I I was at a very very vulnerable time in my life when I saw it, and it it really frightened me. And Don't Look Now, which is a movie that a lot of people haven't seen. And you don't see anything, but the direction in it, it just, it builds. And the expectation of what is going to come is what's so frightening for me. Yeah. <clears throat> Next. Lewis, go. I'm, so now I'm curious. Oh, okay. Uh, definitely uh, The Exorcist and uh, Don't Look Now, Don't Look Now, is that what you said? Yeah. Are scary films. Uh, when I was researching uh, scary films to create a scary scene and figure out how to do it, 
Uh, I uh -oh. selected Jaws and waited till dark for, in Jaws, it was a scene where Richard Dreyfuss is swimming underwater uh, at night and a head falls down into the hole, which has been bitten in the side of the boat by a shark. It gets a big scream every time it's screened in an auditorium. And the other scene was a scene from Wait Until Dark, uh, where mm -hmm. Audrey Hepburn and Alan Arkin are, uh, where he jumps out a door and attacks Audrey Hepburn, who's blind in that film. It was really great. But the scariest movie, those are scary scenes. Yeah. But I would say I feel that a recent film, uh, by that, I mean, about four years ago, a Steven Soderbergh film called Unsane that he shot with an iPhone mm -hmm. is one of the oh most, scary, with one of the most suspenseful scary films I've ever seen. Wow. <clears throat> I, I know of it, but I haven't had a chance to catch it yet. And now I shall. Absolutely. Danny, you got one? You're all going to laugh, but I'm a Capricorn, and so I have control issues. And so for me, <laughs> the, me the, the movie that scared me so much so that I actually had to leave my seat and stand by the door of the theater because I just couldn't handle it was The Blair Witch Project. Oh. And, uh, you know, say what you will about that dumb movie, but just that camp, just it being from this person's perspective, and I couldn't see anything, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And at the time, I still didn't know the whole backstory because they really built it up as this is real footage. I don't know. For some reason, I just could not. Now I can watch it fine. But the first time I saw that, um, I, it was terrifying to me. Is that weird? It's so weird. No, I, everybody's scared of being lost in the woods. I mean, it's a, yeah. it a primal concern. And that's that's that whole the crux of that whole film. Yeah, for sure. So, no, absolutely. No, that that. That totally works. John, that was a great question. And GalaxyCon viewers, this has been my time with the cast and creatives oh. of Cujo, D, Lou, and Dan, Danny. Any final words for our audience before we take our leave? We love you. Horror fans are the best. We love you, love you, love you. Oh, absolutely. Once again, thank you for joining us on the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Thank you to our audience for joining us, and thank you for your great questions. Hope to see you all again soon. Until then, bye-bye, everyone. Take care, and please remember that smiles are free. Spend them often. Yeah.